what if they can't get to us? What if all the help we want can't get in because the freeways are closed or the railroads are closed and we're cut off? How could we be ready as a community to deploy our own volunteers and set up our own system of helping each other to get through a prolonged crisis? A drastic change just this week from extreme to even worse, if that's possible, as California suffers through an unprecedented drought that we've been covering over half the state, now facing the most severe conditions. This is massive. We're talking 60 miles long by 40 miles wide into its ninth day. And you know, Harris, we normally get a rain in mid-November, kind of the mark to end of the fire season. Not this year. And intensifying tonight, crossing into Santa Barbara County, racing across the hills, forcing families to evacuate, families that had very little warning. Hundreds of emergency responders are searching for victims right now, breaking through roofs and sifting through mud. 100 homes destroyed in these horrific mudslides, 300 others damaged. There are 17 confirmed dead. Water rushing from the mountains triggered mudslides. 12 people are in the hospital. Tidal wave of mud and debris destroyed several homes. Mud and debris that just came rushing off. The haunting scene played out across Montecito, where there was mind-boggling destruction everywhere. Heard this noise and I immediately knew that this was something terrible. I, I knew that the flood was coming, the monster was unleashed, and I started sprinting back as fast as I could, yelling flash flood, flash flood, flash flood. Turn around, the flash flood's right there. The flash flood's right there. Oh my God, mom. Close the door! The noise was, was horrific. The, the street sounded like a parade of tanks going by. It was very mechanical, with sandstone and metal and grinding and, and cars being ripped apart and telephone poles being smashed and, and broken. Um, the front of our driveways had a whole different sound and it was a wet sound and then there were boulders and trees and, and debris hitting our house and it was just very loud and the whole house was shaking and it was very violent. There's nothing I could do, I'm sorry you guys. Just gotta survive one more second, one more second, one more second. And those seconds are gonna add up to minutes, into half, hours, hours, and then we'd be halfway there. So we brought my mom up to the edge of the driveway, had her hold onto the hedge and there was a fire uh, vehicle and I was able to flag them down. I told my mom the house did its job. It protected us in the most vicious storm that anybody in the area living has ever experienced. It really didn't start raining until about 2 a.m. and it just felt like regular rain until the fire explosion, the gas explosion happened and the sky turned orange. At 4 o'clock in the morning I don't really know what woke me up. I was pregnant, so maybe it was like, I don't know, baby or... But I woke up and I looked out of the bedroom window towards the mountain and saw the mountain just coming. So screamed and woke Napper up and Napper ran to get our son upstairs and I ran back because it was too late to go that way. In that time period, Montecito just got nailed, just got hammered. So, I'm getting emotional now because I lost friends in it. When I was a child, I'd always go into the creek and go swimming, and I, that for me was my place. It was my safe haven. It was my place to go where it was safe, not a place of, of death. It wasn't a place of terror. It was a place of beauty and inspiration. My little boy was standing at the top of the stairs. I grabbed him and walked into the middle of the house and I couldn't even, it was so much noise. I never even, I didn't know that the house had torn away till I had walked to the top of the stairs to call for Mary. And I realized the door was just swinging into the abyss. And then I found out a friend of mine lost her children, two of her children. And then, um, it hit me, you know, it was, it was my creek. It was a place I used to play that was safe. I, I love big storms. I'm like stoked, yeah, we got a big storm, but losing friends wasn't fun. 
and it turned into a place of of death. Um, an hour later, I heard Mary's voice, and I was like, okay, my son's okay, my wife's okay. So I think the worst is over. At that point, when we crossed the Milpas Street Bridge, I looked back and saw the most beautiful rainbow. It was just the most intense, bright rainbow. And uh, it was a sign that we had survived this very intense disaster and that uh, we were going to be okay. The one nine debris flow affected our entire community, so that's a little over 8,000 people. It uh, killed 21 people, destroyed more than 180 homes, damaged 300 others. It created a brand new landscape in our community, and we have a very difficult recovery ahead of us. So we've kind of got our first uh, bit of evidence as you hike up the stream here for Come on. what the debris flow brought down. Good boy. The source area for the flow is at the top of the mountain range um, and all the chaparral that is burnt, their roots are holding the soil together and their leaves are dampening the effect of the rain that's coming down really hard. And without those two things, it can start detaching loose material and uh, you know, bring it down into the channel, mixed with the water is mud. And then that mud can become a mud flow that's higher and higher. And now it has enough strength essentially to pick up boulders and then mobilize all this other stuff that's sitting in the channel too. So it's kind of like a, again, the snowball effect. Come on, buddy. It gives a good idea of the scale. You know, if you think about how tall I am, Think about those boulders and then think about a flow being jumping up over this nose of rock or ridge of rock coming through here. It's pretty impressive and kind of gives you a, a good feel for what must have been going on uh, at around 4 a.m. on January 9th. We're standing in the voluntary evacuation zone. Across the street from us is the mandatory evacuation zone, but both of them are in the path of San Ysidro Creek, which is 200 yards behind me. The terminology is, I think, confusing because there really isn't a voluntary or mandatory evacuation. Um, those are terms that people use. We have an evacuation order and an evacuation warning. And the only difference really is that a sheriff's deputy comes and knocks on your door and advises you to leave. When you back up to where we were on January 5th, uh, and the weekend that followed before the 1-9 debris flow. With all the information we had, uh, I wouldn't have changed a thing that we did. Remembering putting in context of not what we know now, that's, that's, that's easy, anybody can make those decisions. But making decisions in advance of what happened, I think we did as good as could be expected. As someone who works in the environmental profession, I understand the challenges of people who work in emergency management and obviously I want to be a good citizen and make sure that rules are followed. It did feel arbitrary to me to be asked to leave based on the fire map, um, but after that, every time we were asked to leave, we did leave. And in the future, we will do the same. And I think that they learned lessons from how that map was drawn and that in the future they will be more cautious about 
evacuating more people. People evacuated for the fire, and then they came back after the evacuation. Then they were told, no, you got to evacuate again. And they said, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. What do you mean? I don't know exactly what they said, but only 12% of this town evacuated. We lost a lot of friends and families and neighbors, and that's, that's the take-home message is, is when authorities tell you to leave, you have to leave. And as, as frustrating and as annoying and as expensive as it may seem to evacuate yet one more time, they're doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have. The areas in yellow, a lot of people think that that's a voluntary area. You know, if they're in that area, they're safe. It's just kind of a warning. What it really means is it's quite different. It means that if there is a uh, heavy band of rain that comes through those areas, they're still at a risk of a debris flow, and there's a potential that they could be cut off for long periods of time. But all of these areas face some sort of a risk. The red is a very real extreme risk. Those are the areas that are closest to the water courses, so the creeks and the streams, where all the debris is going to be coming down. But what we saw in the January 9th debris flow in Montecito was that if you get a, enough rain and you get enough of the material coming down from the higher elevations, the debris flows don't follow the old water courses. What they do instead is they have a tendency to fan out. So we think we know where they're going to go, but they don't always follow these paths. We are having more weather-related natural disasters every year than we've ever seen. Scientists have been telling us for decades that warmer air and warmer water will create the conditions that we've been seeing, which is longer fire seasons and stronger weather events. When it does rain, it's going to rain a lot harder in a lot shorter amount of time. So that danger still exists up there. And it's important that the community understands that we're going to be in the same situation this winter, so we need to be prepared. I have no idea. I don't know what's going to happen this winter. But I'm ready. But that's my biggest concern is what's what's coming forward after this event. Because we have a we have a lot of people here and you know we lost a lot of people last year and uh, yeah I'm I'm concerned. Definitely concerned. Okay, so he wants to dump this stuff. Okay. Okay? Is everybody here still? This stuff is all going to go in the uh, the bin? In the, so in the big bin? I got it. She was? Do you want these ones? Is this set aside? Yeah. Was this set aside? Okay. Was this I, set aside? Uh, um, because there's other drawers. What, what'd you pick something? Drawers. Got a homeowner like this guy who didn't even know that he could ask for us to help. And he just figured, because we've been driving by him for the last six months, or you know, four or five months, working down below. And then he finally figured out that he could call up and asked, and here we are. The Bucket Brigade was formed in the aftermath of the January 9th debris flow, biggest uh, mudslide slash debris flow in Santa Barbara County history that followed the biggest fire in California history. My wife and I were sitting around the dinner table talking about uh, the situation and how our friends were in a bad spot. And you know, uh, the friend in particular that we were talking about, his house was knee deep in mud and his yard was thigh deep in mud. And the insurance adjuster showed up and said, hey, look, I can't tell if your house is damaged because I can't see anything but mud. And it made my wife and I really angry to hear this. <laughs> And we thought about it, we went, oh, you know, that's just the worst. And then we said, you know, we should just go dig them out. But while we were doing this, it aroused the interest of all the neighbors. And they said, hey, look, you know, what are you doing? And we said, well, we're digging them out. And they said, well, will you help us? <laughs> and we thought about it and we were like, yeah, yeah, we'll help you too. Um, and so we just kept going. We just kept coming. We didn't go to our jobs. We showed up the next day, you know, 30 people showed up. The next day, 50 people showed up. Wednesday, 70 people showed up. Thursday, 90. Friday, we moved to the park because so many people were coming that we were jamming the whole neighborhood with our cars. I had this theory, and it was just a theory, but the idea was in every community, there's a small percentage of people that are very strong empathizers. And so when they see a disaster or they see something really traumatic happen to people, it causes them trauma. Those people are out there and that they're in, we believe, every community and that if we kind of recognize that resource and tap it, uh, we can 
a be more ready for a disaster in our community and and then b respond more effectively to a disaster in a community and that's kind of why we founded the bucket brigade like you saw a coffee shop staying open and grocery staying stores open. just when, to like you know give places for refuge refuge yeah. even when they were told to close yeah. they, they they had that courage we here at the village of wine are considered to be an institution and as a tribute to my father john bray we stayed here throughout the whole Thomas fire and kept the doors open for the firefighters just to give them access to restroom and a cold drink. When uh, the 9-1 debris flow hit and it was so catastrophic, my brother and I uh, hiked in through Coast Village Road, right, going through the Nina Wayside mud. This is an absolute catastrophe for Montecito. So number one, first of all, see if the store is still standing. And if it is, number two, open it up for the first responders. All right, guys. Thank, hey, the community thanks you. Village News and why we thank all of you. You guys are doing an amazing job. All right, guys, thank you so much. All right, thank you. This, this store is the ground zero. Because this is what keeps, you know, this town going. This <laughs> and John and now Pat. And we literally hand carved 100 sandwiches the day of the debris flow. I wouldn't accept money from anybody because in good conscience we wouldn't do that in honor and respect of what my father did during the tea fire. Uh, and they were so moved by it that I made a promise no matter what, I would you know do what it takes to keep this establishment open to support them. You know, when, when you see the effect, I mean, my landlord, the, the person I rent this place from, lost his girlfriend. Um, you know, uh, Sawyer, one of the kids that will come here every Friday. Uh, so this hits near and dear to the heart, and this is my community. I've been here since I was three. So, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you know, stuff like that moves you to, to do things that are greater than you. Finally, finally got a plumeria to bloom. Years and years I've been trying to get one to bloom. So I'm pretty happy about that. Rebirth, rising up from the mud. And everybody talking to each other, and I started seeing camaraderie and this coming together that really blew me away because I didn't expect that. I thought people thought, well, everyone in Montecito is so rich, who cares, right? Totally changed. Everybody came, became people. They were people, we were all the same. So this is an event that was organized by the community to bring the community together to break bread. So super important for the community at the grassroots level to be engaged as one. 